Sometimes unexpected visitors can really ruin your day. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Alan Duffy, Swinburne astronomer and lead scientist of the Royal Institution of Australia. Welcome, Dr. Duffy. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Give us a brief summary of your background and your work at the university. I'm a professional astronomer, uh, which means that I take data of the cosmos of the heavens uh, using telescopes from around the world, as well as uh, run models of how galaxies form and stars move, planets uh, spin around stars uh, using supercomputer simulations. Essentially, I do everything I can to investigate the universe around me here at Swinburne University. The Earth had a visitor in late July. Tell us about Asteroid 2019 OK. This was a surprising visitor. Uh, essentially, we knew of a couple of asteroids that were uh, long predicted to fly by, essentially outside of the orbit of the moon. And that really is the, the unofficial definition of what's considered close. If it's outside the moon, it's not a problem. Uh, I got some calls from journalists going, we're hearing that there's this uh, close flyby. And, and I was absolutely unimpressed. I was saying, no, no, it's all fine. There's no story. And then a trusted journalist colleague of mine did ask me to check. And when I checked, I was horrified because there was an asteroid flying by, but it was well inside the orbit of the moon. Roughly speaking, about uh, 70,000 kilometers at closest approach that's, that's about 50 uh, some thousand miles to put that in context that's just a couple of times further out than our global positioning satellites that is very close and very uncomfortable because you have an object about the size of a 30 story building some 100 meter or so across that is a big object it can make a real mess if it hit the earth now there's no uh, no chance of it hitting at this this point but the fact that we only really had a couple of hours warning was extremely uncomfortable for something as large as that. What was the sequence of events that led us to detecting the asteroid? Did its direction of travel have anything to do with us finding it? Yeah, so this was picked up by uh, all sky, so-called all sky um, automated observatories. So we're constantly looking out for uh, objects that, that change in the night sky, typically exploding stars, uh, objects like that. Uh, but we can also then track uh, objects that are close to the Earth because they change in position relative to the background stars. Essentially, the position of the stars don't change over the course of nights. But if, say, you're an asteroid flying um, close to the Earth, you certainly will change in position. And that was picked up, but only a couple of days before its uh, closest flyby, closest approach. Uh, essentially, this is because the object, although large at 100 meters, is astronomically speaking small. And because we're relying on reflected starlight, or sorry, sunlight, I should say, uh, to pick these objects up, uh, when you're only 100 meters across, you're really not reflecting much light at all. So we saw a very faint object that appeared to move over the course of a couple of nights. But by the time that reached a critical threshold of detection, essentially because it was a, a bright enough source to follow up, we, it was essentially upon us. Uh, the automated alert for um, follow-up of this transient, that is changing event, came out, but with essentially a couple of hours notice. Uh, and then we had almost no time to actually deploy any telescopes or indeed even follow up with radar to figure out exactly how large the subject was or uh, the rest of its, its orbital parameters. Essentially, by the time it was close enough to see, and even with a pair of binoculars, you could actually pick this object up if you knew where to look, uh, it was essentially past us. It was very dramatic, very quick, and it really is uh, a reminder that we have to do better in terms of these automated surveys because we need longer than a couple of days and, and even in this case just a couple of hours to actually try and do something about this kind of near flyby asteroid. How often do we get visitors passing within the orbit of the moon? 
these can happen. It's, it's not unusual for objects to travel within the orbit of the moon. Uh, essentially, a couple of times a year, we'll get uh, at least a, an object. But, but to be this large at 100 meters, this is the largest, closest flyby I can remember. Uh, I don't want to be definitive and say in my lifetime, but certainly in my professional lifetime, I've never seen anything quite like this. So this isn't very common, uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't have to be uh, that common for it to be catastrophic if it does hit. We would expect an object the size of 2019 OK uh, to hit essentially once every couple of thousand years or so. Um, the universe doesn't keep a tally, however, just we can't say that we're overdue in any way for, for an event. They are random, uh, but it's definitely something that would happen uh, uncomfortably uh, common. And because of our connected world, any kind of collision of an asteroid this size with a populated area, it will wipe out that city. We call these, these objects city killers. It would have had an energy something of the order 30 times that of uh, the blast energy of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. But we really uh, would then worry about the knock-on effects. The, the, uh, you could imagine if this thing hit New York or London or some, some critical city to the, the global uh, economy and network, it would absolutely cause catastrophe and, and uh, enormous hardship in the local area through the direct impacts, but then the knock-on effects would be catastrophic. So. Just because these things don't happen all that often, it doesn't mean that we don't have to start searching for them because the sooner we see them, the more we can do to actually deflect them. So let's talk specifically then. So what is the overall path of 2019 OK's orbit? Will it continue to orbit the sun in a relatively close proximity? This, uh, this orbit will have been changed by the close flyby of Earth, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. These kind of near-Earth um, asteroids, essentially they're uh, moving in an orbit around the sun, extending out as far as Mars, for example. Uh, the gravitational influence of the large planet Jupiter is, is more important in terms of nudging these objects onto potential collision paths with us. And NASA keeps a, 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 an updated list of the most hazardous objects that we're aware of. Uh, typically, these things don't have more than a one in a thousand chance of colliding with us, and those odds rapidly diminish as we get better uh, information about the orbits through follow-up telescope observations. And that's really where we're at right now. There's a, there's a collection of objects we're aware of. Uh, none of them are particularly worrying us. However, as 2019 OK has shown, just because there's nothing out there we're aware of to worry about doesn't mean we shouldn't be worried because as far as we know, there are 99 for every one of these objects that we have seen that are currently unknown. So about 100 times more objects out there we're unaware of, and that is a very scary number. Yes, it is, yikes. So <laughs> what kind of new technology is out there that would let us detect these, these types of threats um, better? Essentially, we need a global network of facilities. It, it's not good enough to have uh, just one country, in, say, in the Northern Hemisphere, the U.S. facilities monitoring, because, of course, we have the Southern Hemisphere, or the Southern Sky. Here in Australia, we have a, a great responsibility to safeguard the rest of the world by doing our bit to monitor our sky. Now, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a dedicated facility for, for that. So hopefully this will be something this asteroid will prompt us to change and to join the global effort. It doesn't take much to find these uh, objects. Essentially, you need a, a dedicated robotic telescope, very wide field of view. So in other words, you're able to monitor essentially the entire sky um, all at once. And remember, all you're trying to look for is something that's changing relative to the background stars. So you need to constantly be looking at the night sky every night and ideally a continual survey from telescopes around the world. Essentially, as, as uh, the sun sets, the telescope dome opens and the observations begin. And as the sun rises, well, you have a telescope on the other side of the world that takes over. And in that way, we can have this constant monitoring because that's the key. If we have enough data, enough pictures, 
of the night sky, we will notice these things changing against the background stars, and we will be able to then figure out their orbits, ensure through supercomputer uh, modeling whether these things are a threat or not. And if they are a threat, hopefully we have decades of warning to try and do something about it. Dr. Alan Duffy, Swinburne astronomer and lead scientist of the Royal Institution of Australia. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to find out more about 2019 OK or just the work that you're doing. How can they do that? Well, unfortunately, as with everyone else, uh, I'm on Twitter uh, for my sins and I very much respond on Twitter as well, uh, far more often than an email. So follow me on Twitter at Astro Duff and I will uh, try to answer your questions as best I can. Thanks again so much for your time, Dr. Duffy. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.